All right, we're back from break. Now, guys, there's actually one topic that I want to teach you guys that you will not see in the videos because I haven't posted it. However, I'm going to record it right now in Panopto, and I'm going to post it on YouTube, but it's not in any of my videos. I'd love for you guys to pay attention if you want to, and if not, it's okay. Here is the question that I'm going to answer. Why is our... Sorry, is SN1 called SN1? And why is SN2 called SN2? And you might think, who cares? So that's actually a very important question because... Once you understand this, it allows you to do question number number eight on our problem set. Here's the answer. The term SN1 stands for substitution nucleophilic unimolecular. Yeah, unimolecular. And then SN2 stands for substitution nucleophilic uh, bimolecular. Now, you might look at that and think, who in the world came up with such an odd... Uh, abbreviation. I strongly suspect that both of these were probably derived from another language, or from a chemist who spoke another language in which they place adjectives uh, after the noun, such as espanol. Does that make sense? So it's probably substitución nucleophilia or something like that. Anyway, so that's sort of the idea. All right, what about the one? What about the two? What in the world's really going on? Okay, here's the deal. An SN1 reaction proceeds like this, as I showed you guys in the other video. You've got a leaving group, and it takes off. This is actually and can be an equilibrium scenario. So this could go back on and go back and forth, potentially. Then you have a weak nucleophile. Do, 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 do. Attack and form a bond with that carbon and give you your product. This is SN1. This step is the slow step. And when I say the slow step, what I mean is it is the rate-determining step. By raise of hands, anyone who's willing to admit it, how many of you guys have had the glorious opportunity to work on an assembly line? You have. I have too. Okay, imagine in an assembly line, everyone's job is to do something to the whatever they're assembling, right? I put a screw in a hole or in a couple of holes, and then I pass it down the line. If you've got someone way up the line who is slow, what is the rate of the... So I actually worked on an assembly line building treadmills. What is the rate of... Or what rate are the treadmills coming out the other end? If there's one slow guy holding up the whole line. Exactly. It is equal to whatever the speed is that he is. Because everyone after him is going faster than he can, he's the one that sets the speed of the whole line. So if he's going one treadmill an hour, oh my heavens, one treadmill an hour, because everyone else is are just like sitting there, and as soon as he's done, can just go, bam, 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 and it's done. And by the time they're done with all their stuff, he's still working on his. The rate of treadmills coming out the other end is one treadmill per hour. The slow step is the rate-determining step. So let me ask you guys this question. In an SN1 reaction, how many molecules are present on the left side of the reaction that's the right determining step? How many molecules are present on the left side of this reaction? There's just one, this starting material. So what that means is you can increase or decrease the concentration of the nucleophile as much as you want, and it will not change the speed of this reaction. It does nothing to it. Because the, the guy who's determining this, or dictating the speed of the reaction is this guy. So molecule A, molecule B, changing the concentration of B doesn't affect the rate. Only the concentration of A affects the rate. So in other words, let me ask another insulting question. How many molecules affect the rate? One, right? There you go. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate the enthusiasm. Because only one, one molecule affects the rate, we call it SN1. Does that make sense? That's it. All right. Don't worry. We'll get to question eight in a minute. Any questions on this? 
Sha-na-na-na. Okay. Now we're going to draw out the mechanism for SN2. In an SN2 reaction, I've got a leaving group, and I've got a strong nucleophile, usually and almost always something with a localized negative charge, that comes in and kicks off the leaving group. Well, bam! And then replaces it. There is, of course, an inversion of stereochemistry if I have like an enantiopure or a stereocenter here, which I don't in this example. Okay, how many steps are there? There's really only one. So this is the slow step, and it's not really that slow because it's the only step. I shouldn't say slow. This is the rate determining step. That's it. So, I ask the insulting question, how many molecules participate in the rate determining step in an SN2? Two. two. So I'll write down, because two molecules, both A and B, and I'll go ahead and write a B next to my nuke and an A next to my starting material, participate in the rate determining step, the rate will be affected by changing the concentration of either of those. The concentration of A or the concentration of B. We call it SN2 because there are two molecules involved in the rate determining step. That makes sense. All right, now, let's see if we can answer question number eight. Well, bam! i got to stop doing that. Okay. It says, indicate which of the following reactions will go faster if the concentration of the nucleophile is increased. First of all, we have to determine if it's an SN1 or an SN2. Okay? SN2. So will changing the concentration of nu the nucleophile affect the rate of this? Yes, it will. Okay. How about this one? SN1 or SN2? It's also a two. Will changing the concentration of the nucleophile affect this? Yes. How about this thing? I've got a uh, bromine stuck to tertiary carbon. By the way, I mentioned in the videos this, tertiaries don't go SN2 at all, no matter what you do. And the reason is because a nucleophile can't get into a tertiary because it's got three carbons flanking it. It's hard to get into that hole. Even if I had a strong nuke. Instead, it does something called an elimination of the reaction that's covered in Chapter 9. That's a preview and a plug for watching the Chapter 9 lecture videos that are already posted in a theater near you. This nucleophile, strong or weak? It's weak because it's got a delocalized negative charge. Sorry, guys. So this will be then one. So changing the concentration of my nucleophile, if I, in, if I crank up the concentration of my nuke, will it increase the rate of that reaction? No. No rate change. That's exactly right. Thank you for saying it with confidence and pride. The reason is because the rate determining step is the slow guy at the beginning of the assembly line. It's this bromine leaving to give me a tertiary carbocation cation, and everyone else after it is just sitting there. Are you done yet? Are you done yet? Are you done yet? And as soon as the bromine comes off, this guy just goes, well, bam, and makes a product. And while the next bromide is sitting there going, Aah. and as soon as it comes off, this guy goes, well, bam, and makes the product. And then they're waiting around for the next guy. Aah. See what I'm saying? Sometimes real men have to wear the stretchy pants.